I have observed that the most celebrated chroniclers, before they begin to write their histories, first set forth a prologue and a preface. I have not allowed my speaking English to blind me to the Global South's common narrative of a great navigator arriving, followed some years later by a first fleet of dispossessors armed with pistols and cannons. I refuse to allow my whiteness to inhibit acknowledging that this country co-inhabits the same but different past shared without exception by all former European colonies, wheresoever they may be. I believe that complexity is the new obscene and that no image or cultural object of any consequence transmits a flat, mono-dimensional story. Colonial panegyrics were oft written by persons who themselves, knowing nothing, have received no true account from others of what really took place. To return to my tale, we hoped that by keeping near the coast, we should be able to find water, either in pools or by digging, and had for some time seen the necessity of carrying water with us rather than trust to the contingency of falling in with any holes at those places where necessity herself might oblige us to halt. The soldiers knew that it was neither in accordance with the law of God nor of the king that we should make free men slaves. They had seen the gold and figures who appeared to be committing sodomy one with another, for there were boys dressed like women who went about for gain by that cursed practice. Our boats being of no further use to us, we hauled them up on the bank, leaving them with keel upwards. Having pitched the tents, we sent our people in several directions in quest of water. When, after a diligent search, some was discovered where the natives had encamped some time since. We thought there might be a river or a stream there where we could provide ourselves with water of which we had great need, and our journey was unavoidably lengthened in hopes of finding it. The best horses and riders were chosen to form the cavalry, and the horses had little bells attached to their breastplates. The Indians thought that the horse and its rider was all one animal, for they had never seen horses up to this time. We showed them their image in a glass and took them to our horses, the sight of which, with everything about them, was a source of much surprise. Having passed the heads of some lagoons, the country becomes exceedingly brushy and assumes a greyish gloominess. We stopped in order to rest our horses, who had, by reason of hard labour, through intricate country, with little provision and still less water, become much debilitated. The country at the verge of the horizon southerly is in flames, being fired by natives, and some were of the opinion that we should fall upon them that very night, for, as the proverb says, who attacks, conquers. We could distinctly hear the conversation of natives, who appeared to be on the same side of the river on which we were encamped but they were not seen. Then the warriors, who were drawn up in battle array, began to whistle and sound their trumpets and drums. Their faces were painted black and white, and by signs they asked whether we came from where the sun rose, and we replied that we did. 
These Indians carried very long bows and good arrows and lances. These pieces of wood were about nine feet long and had been split out of the center of some trees that had been broken down by natives and doubtless intended for spears. The captain told them that we came from a distant country and were vassals of a great emperor and that they ought to acknowledge him as their lord and it would be to their advantage to do so and that in return for the beads they might bring us some food and poultry. They replied that they would bring the food for which we asked but as for the rest they already had a chief. Being desirous to continue our journey this day, we left our resting place and entered a dense bushy scrub, abounding with the same description of plants as I have frequently observed. We continued in the vale all day in order to make some general observations relative to the natural productions that would be so beneficial to the settlers in this fertile tract of someone else's country. Near our encampment was a native grave, its regular manner and systematical mode in which everything connected with it is disposed, led us to conclude that this mausoleum contained the remains of some person of eminence, either a chief or one who had acquired from his skill in hunting the respect and awe of his countrymen. Then when the governor saw how rich were these lands, he ordered another fleet, much larger than the first, and took formal possession of this land in the name of his majesty. They bought jewels of gold, and we gave them beads in return, and the beads were valueless. It will be said, that in spinning old yarns, I am forgetting my narrative. So let's get back to it. If, in defending ourselves, some natives should be killed and others hurt, theirs would be the fault and the burden, and it would not lie with us. The hills produce a slatty stone and it is the opinion of some of us that coal might be found beneath its surface. But the difficulty of turning any such production found here to any colonial use or benefit renders its examination scarcely worth the expense it would naturally occur. They insisted on saying that if we advanced beyond the palm trees, they would kill us, and the cannon shot forth lightning, such as falls from heaven. The warriors, with their feathered crests waving, attacked us hand to hand, and hurling their lances with all their might, they did us much damage. Perhaps there are few instances, as we have seen none in our journey, wherein a greater tenacity of life had shown itself than in this instance. This morning I sowed the following seeds, peach, apricot, lemons and loquats, with scarlet runners, long potted beans, marrow fat peas, celery, parsnip, cabbage, lettuce and carrot. Round this small garden I formed a slight hedge of green boughs and large branches. When the soothsayers and wizards and many priests had got together and made their prophecies and forecasts and performed all the other rites according to their use, it seemed that they had said by their divinations that they had found out we were men of flesh and blood. While attention is called to the great treasures which were sent to their majesties, we often overlook that this transfer of wealth continues, now in the form of outrageous profits repatriated 
to the still equally distant stakeholders. The same but different exploiters of what were and continue to be the traditional lands of the peoples who occupied the global south before the arrival of the great navigators. It will be said that I am always turning aside to tell old stories. However, it is surely more than mere coincidence that both Cook and Magellan were killed by those on whose lands they were intruding. Their miraculous face prosceniums are now among the most consequent treasures of the Museum of Unnatural History. Lest we forget that among its many other associations, purple is always the colour of flesh when bruised. <laughs>